Hello, everyone. FG back again. Uh, this um, may be a little bit of a controversial video. Uh, at least it uh, certainly started some controversy on the Frontier Owners Club uh, forum. In some quarters, this generates almost as much controversy as who makes the best motor oil or should you ever use a power flush in your transmission. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm talking about the NVVCS, or Nissan Variable Voltage Control System. And that's okay. If you don't have any idea what that is, I'm going to go through it and explain step by step. So back in the day when automobiles were a lot simpler, they had a generator. All this did was spin uh, from power from the engine from a belt and then generated electricity. And that electricity generation rate was controlled by a very simple regulator which was usually mounted somewhere on the firewall. Generators themselves create a straight DC power current, which really is what you're looking for to charge your battery. But unfortunately, just due to the general construction of a generator, they have a maximum power output, which is not very high. And as vehicles gained more electric uh, windows, uh, cruise control, power locks, more powerful headlamps, um, more powerful heating system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, all the new electronics that have gotten piled on top the uh, power demand in a standard vehicle has, has risen a lot, um, probably four to five times what the early vehicles pulled. So given that, that gave the manufacturers some headaches, and they had to come up with something new. So they switched to what's called an alternator, which is sort of like a generator, except it's actually generating AC power. And you're probably maybe, if you know enough about that, scratching your head going, well, wait a minute, how are you going to do that? AC power... But my battery is DC. You are correct. Inside of that alternator is a set of diodes, uh, usually six if I remember correctly. And they take that AC and convert it to DC by chopping that AC waveform in half. So you have a positive going cycle and a negative going cycle. And each set of diodes is taking half of that waveform and converting it to a, a, a DC power. Uh, however, it does have a little bit of ripple to it. That's the leftovers of the AC signal. And that can sometimes generate noise in uh, stereo systems and other things that are sensitive to that problem. So now we've introduced a whole other type of problem, which usually is not so much of a big deal. Now, here's where things get even more complicated. After the vehicle manufacturers started adding all these electronic extra modules for stereo equipment, uh, GPS, you know, onboard navigation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all these have to talk to each other. And the wiring harness was just getting out of control. It was getting big, it was getting heavy, and it was consuming a ton of copper. So the auto manufacturers turned around and said, hey, we need to do something about this. And they took a page, basically, from the computer industry and said, hey, why don't we develop a communication network where all of these little boxes can talk to each other on a loop instead of all having to be directly wired one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, and how much copper and wire and giant connectors that requires. And so that's called a CAN bus, car area network. So how that works is it sends a digital signal from one control module to the next and says, hey, I'm the engine controller. I want to talk to the instrument cluster. I'm sending you information on how fast the engine is spinning so you can turn the RPM gauge. I'm sending you information on how fast the vehicle is moving so you can work the speedometer. And then, of course, all the ancillary gauges, you know, how hot is the engine coolant? Uh, what is the voltage doing? how full is the fuel tank, et cetera, et cetera. So all this information is now flying around in digital packets with identifiers tagged onto them so that uh, whichever module knows what it's supposed to be listening for can take that data and decode it and then display it or use it as needed. So with all that going on, the manufacturers went even further and decided, hey, since uh, the federal government likes us to save fuel, what if we come up with this idea where the engine controller actually cycles how much power the alternator is going to produce. Bingo. Here you go. Here is your variable voltage control system, which sounds like a pretty good idea in theory. The problem is that theory often doesn't make it to the real world very well. And in my humble opinion, this is one of them. There will be people that are, will argue I can guarantee it. Because like I said, this was opening a giant can of worms 
on the forum anytime everybody ever mentions it. But it is very easily possible um, on the older vehicles, at least the second generation, to defeat this system. So if you look at this picture of the uh, negative battery terminal, you'll see that there's some kind of a weird-looking box attached to it. Okay, and what that basically is is a sensor which tells the engine controller how much power is being used by the vehicle. So everything is grounded to the chassis. Then back through the battery is this heavy battery cable with this sensor installed. So everything that's running, when it's turning on and off, you flip on the headlights, a couple more amperes disappear. This sensor is just a coil of wire, which then detects that power flowing through it because um, the amount of power flowing through a wire directly affects the magnetic field surrounding it. So that magnetic field can be measured by inducting into this coil of wire, which is basically how a transformer works. The, you know, the big ones up on the pole or whatever you might see in a field, super high voltage, et cetera, et cetera. It's all electricity. It all works the same way. So that uh, sensor signal gets sent back to the ECU, and then the ECU commands the alternator what it's going to do, whether it's charging or it's just loafing along, which sounds like a great idea for saving fuel, but here's the problem. They claim that this is built, that the alternator will go to sleep, so to speak, when the vehicle is under a heavier load, like wide throttle, uh, climbing a hill, anything like that, pulling a trailer, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to free up a few horsepower for the engine to push that through the drivetrain. The problem, however, here is in the programming of how that's been implemented, where it doesn't really work very well as far as keeping the battery charged. It's overzealous in stepping the, the power output down which usually results in a battery that's running undercharged constantly. This can create all sorts of problems, including causing some of those modules that we were talking about a few minutes ago uh, to go a little bonkers because they like to see at least 12 volts. And if they're seeing right around 12 or less, they can definitely malfunction. You might start seeing warning lamps. Uh, things may not function correctly. Anti-lock brakes, et cetera, et cetera. Your windows take longer to roll up. If you've added extra batteries for a trailer or anything like that, it will take much longer for them to charge correctly. So... <laughs> Again, like I said, this opening a can of worms, there are definitely going to be people that are going to disagree with me, but I think that this is a horrible idea that was stuffed on us by the federal government doing another overreach, as they're definitely known to do. However, this one can be, at least in the second generation, Frontier 2005 to 2020 can be easily defeated by simply disconnecting the plug, which goes to that sensor on the negative battery wire. And you see in the, the other two photos more of a close-up of that sensor, and it's really easy. You just pop that connector loose. I would strongly recommend, as I did, to put some tape over the end of that connector uh, because that goes directly back to a pin on the engine control module, the, the ECU. And you definitely don't want that uh, to, to touch any metal and get grounded. I'm not sure what that would do, but I'm not planning to find out. ECUs are not cheap. So I taped mine up real good after I disconnected it. So to finish out the video, okay, so you did that. What did you gain? Okay, great question. Well, before, when I was usually watching um, my OBD2 Edge CS digital multi-gauge, it would show me that most of the time the battery was, was running below 13 volts, which is really not that great. Most vehicles, when they're charging and they're charging correctly, usually run between 13.7 and uh, as a high 14.1, maybe 14.2. After I disconnected it, I've seen nothing less that I remember than 13.7. That keeps the battery much better charged. It'll crank faster. The engine starts easier. You've got a higher voltage being supplied to everything, including the ignition control module. And what I think is kind of, in some ways, even more critical than that, are the ignition coils. 
These are all direct fire, and there's six coils on the V6 Frontier engine, or obviously four, of course, if you have the inline four-cylinder. But anyway, that's going to provide a higher voltage to the coil, which is, again, just simply another transformer, which just steps up that voltage to it's usually 40-ish thousand, somewhere around there. I don't know exactly what the output of these coils is, but the higher the voltage on the primary, the higher the voltage is going to be on the secondary as well. So a hotter spark will make sure that the fuel is burned completely, which protects the very expensive catalytic converters from being poisoned by unburned fuel making its way through the exhaust system. So in my book, I think this is a win all the way around. There's nothing that I've ever seen that anybody said, oh, that's going to shorten the life of your alternator. It's going to shorten the life of any other component. All this does is revert the control of the alternator back to the alternator itself. The ECU now is out of the loop, and the voltage regulator built into the alternator, which they, they did as a, a fallback uh, failover, I guess you could say, uh, is, is now in control and is running everything correctly. I've had no problems at all. I've not had any modules go bad. I've not had any bulbs blow out. These doom and gloom guys are like, oh, no, no, you can't mess with it. You don't understand what this thing does. It's far too complicated. And all you wannabes that you know think you're electrical engineers, well, I hate to tell them, but I kind of really am one. So... I've seen no trouble. I'll leave that to your determination. But like I said, the information now here at least is available in this video. It's out there in public. Now you are in charge of deciding whether you think this makes sense or not. Now, the 3.8 liter V6 in the later models has a more complicated system, especially the ones with the forward crash detection and lane depart and all that, blah, 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 blah. That has a multi-wire connector um, on that particular defeat unit um, on the negative battery cable. That does get a little more involved. Apparently, some people do see error codes that do not go away when they disconnect that and that causes some people some concern if they take their vehicle in for service will they be denied warranty because they've messed with their harness etc 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 those may be valid questions i'm not i'm not discounting them i'm not poo-pooing it and just saying oh well you're an idiot you don't even need to worry about that why are you asking no those those are valid questions and they they could be potentially problems so I leave it to you, the, the end user, the owner of the vehicle, to decide what you think. Uh, as far as that multi-pin connector on the 3.8 liter, um, I do not own one myself, so I'm not sure if I'm going to make a video about that, but that's beyond the scope of this particular video. This was simply to explain how an alternator works, what's its basic purpose, and what Nissan did. I hope this has been informative and... Um, probably not very entertaining, honestly, but hopefully at least informative. So until next time, Frontier Geek out.